So today we are going to be tackling the skull and then hopefully also getting into the eyes and ears. So let me see here. Sorry, my computer is gonna make noise. All right, so in a little bit, we will do attendance, but not quite yet. Give people a few more minutes to join us. So we are gonna jump straight in to the skull. because <clears throat> so we have quite a few bones and structures to learn today. We are probably, um, an important thing for you to do is compare what you are learning with what is in your workbook. Um, I would use your workbook as your guide of what you need to know for your quizzes and exams. I will try to point out everything that I can that I think is necessary. Um, but when you're doing your homework for the skull and the eyes and the ears, pay attention to the questions that are being asked. You will have identification questions for quizzes and exams. So you'll see something like this exact picture without the labels. So you'll see the lines there. And then what I would do is maybe say this is number one, and then you'd have multiple choice to name that bone. Okay. So that's kind of what you can expect looking forward to your next quiz. And actually, instead of having a quiz, your next testing is your exam, which is on September 9, which is next Wednesday. So we just need to make sure we get through skulls, eyes, and ears. If we miss a little bit, whatever we do miss will not be on the exam. I'm not going to test over a topic that we do not cover. Oh, look, we got some more people in the waiting room. Give me a second here. Okay. <clears throat> so we are going to be going over the skull today. These pictures are from your textbook. And we're going to be going over, sorry. We're gonna start going over the structures. Now you're gonna be having this in lab and hopefully you are gonna be having hands-on skulls that you'll be able to work with and touch them three-dimensionally and find those structures. That's gonna be so helpful for you. So make sure you're using lab to help you learn fully for your lecture as well, okay? Okay, so I'd like to find use a different picture to get started, but I guess we're starting with inside the skull. So let me back up. Okay, so this picture, it's kind of weird that we're starting with this slide, um, but we're basically looking down um, from a superior view inside the skull. Okay, so Stop. Sorry, my computer's being, oh, I thought that was wrong. There we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. Now we're, we're where I want us to be. Okay, so the axial skeleton. So the skull is one of the major components of the axial skeleton, and it forms a longitudinal axis of the body. So longitudinal, think long. Okay, so here we have our, oh, come on, draw. There we have our head or our skull, and then we'll have our vertebra surrounding the spinal column. So the axial skeleton is comprised of the skull. And so right now that's all we're gonna focus on. We'll talk more about the rest of the axial skeleton later. But for the skull, there are eight cranial bones and 14 facial bones, so the bones of the face. Other bones that are associated with the skull, you have six auditory ossicles or ear bones, three on each side. And then you have the hyoid bone, which is kind of high up here in your neck. 
and that helps support several sets of muscles and your tongue. Okay, so functions of the skull, protection. It is the only place in your body where you have an organ completely encased in bone. And that organ is your brain. And so it's there for protection big time. Other functions of the skull has some functions with the respiratory system. So think about your nasal cavity. Um, when you are breathing, you are breathing in through your nasal cavity or in through your mouth, and that travels down through the oropharynx, which is the back side of the throat um, in the head region, in the skull region, and then down. And then the mouth is involved with the digestive system in your teeth as well. So a lot of functions, but the primary function of the skull is protection, protecting the brain. Okay, so 22 bones total. So I could see an easy question asking you how many cranial bones there are or how many facial bones there are. So you would want to know those numbers. So the cranial bones are forming the case that protects your brain, okay? And then the facial bones are right here up in front that are associated with your face. And those are involved with supporting and protecting your respiratory and digestive systems. Okay, so here we have kind of a nice summary slide over the skull. And it breaks it down, shows you how many bones there are total. So in the cranium, eight bones. And there's one occipital bone, two parietal bones, one frontal bone, two temporal, one sphenoid, one ethmoid. And we'll go, we'll look at all of these together. And in the face, you have 14, and almost all of those are paired. Everybody is paired in the facial region except for the vomer and the mandible. And then associated bones, you have your auditory ossicles, and that is three on each side. So a total of six. And then your hyoid bone, which would be kind of found up in here. Okay. <clears throat> Whoops, I went too far. Okay, so cranial bones. These are enclosing the cranial cavity, which includes the brain. In, in addition to the brain, which is the majority of what's in there, you have the blood supply, you have fluid like the cerebral spinal fluid, lots of important nerves and membranes. So your, your um, I'm blinking, like your pia mater, your arachnoid mater, and your dura mater. Those are your three main membranes that you find within the skull encasing your brain. So those are all involved and associated with the cranial cavity. Okay, so we're gonna start, we're looking at side profile um, of the skull. And so we are gonna just start going over each individual bone. So number one, right here is your frontal bone or if and one thing that helps people is if you can identify it on yourself that can be really helpful in fact i've seen students in the past when they're taking exams pointing to different parts of their body and it helps them figure out or remember where a certain structure is because um, they place it on themselves okay so frontal bone frontal bone forehead okay Parietal bone, you have two parietal bones, one on either side, kind of up high right here. And so that's number two. Number three is in the back of your head. That is your occipital bone. Your temporal bone, number four, is right where you would find your temples, okay? So you have one on either side. So you have two parietal bones and two temporal bones. Then you have one sphenoid bone. And it's kind of tricky because if you look at several pictures, it's gonna look like you have two sphenoid bones, but it really is just one bone 
that extends from one side all the way through to the other. It's one large bone that's on the inside of your cranial cavity. So it forms part of your sinuses. Um, in fact, you have sphenoid sinuses. So this is just one side of the sphenoid bone. There is only one sphenoid bone. Okay, zygomatic right here, or people will call your cheekbone. So you have two zygomatic bones. This is a facial bone, okay? Then you have a zygomatic arch. Zygomatic arch is this whole region I just circled where number seven is. And that zygomatic arch is made up of two separate bones. It is made up of the zygomatic process of the temporal bone right here, and then the temporal process of the zygomatic bone here, and they form the zygomatic arch. <clears throat> this large hole right here, number eight, is your external acoustic meatus, which is basically where your ear canals are. Number nine, this big bump is the mastoid process and you can feel that. So if you go behind your ear and kind of feel down below that kind of where your earlobe is, go right behind it, you'll feel a big bump. That is your mastoid process. And then last on this picture, number 10, that pointy structure is the styloid process. And the styloid process is a process where muscles attach Oh, pardon me. It's been a long day. Where some more muscles attach, like the stylohyoid muscle. Um, we obviously haven't covered all the muscle, I mean, all the bones of this picture. I wanted to just point out a couple more because it helps to see them from different points of view. So this one right here is your nasal bone. This orange bone here, you have two of these. It kind of goes right down the middle here. So it's kind of reaches like right here and goes right down the middle. So you have one on either side. This is your maxilla. Let's see if I can write that where it looks okay. Yeah, there we go. Maxilla. I can write nasal. And then down below, we just have one of these, our mandible. All right, I have to do this. This this red bone here, right there. I like this little bone. This is the lacrimal. The lacrimal bone. And okay, I'm just gonna do it. And the one, the green one, is the ethmoid. Okay. So you should be able to identify every bone in this picture. I would expect that you would be able to do that. Okay. Here is a much more detailed picture of the same thing. So let's look back and go, oh, that was nice and simple. And now, oh my goodness, look at all these extra things we have here. Um, I am going to kind of compare with our lecture workbook, because I don't want to overdo it, um, make sure that we're covering it with enough detail. Okay, so there are some extra features here that we have missed. <clears throat> First of all, you should know your sutures. And your sutures are junctions between two bones and they're kind of like little puzzle pieces. They fit together. And then those pieces of bone are held together by collagen fibers in between. So it's a very strong fit. Okay, so going over sutures, the squamous suture you find between the parietal bone and the temporal bone. 
your lambdoid suture right here, you find between your parietal bone and your occipital bone. Not all of them are listed here. If you do, we have this slide in our. Uh, no, this one is. Not, but this picture is in your textbook. Okay. Yeah. Um, oh, give me one second. I'll grab the textbook and tell you what page. Okay. Thank you. Uh, page one, uh, 212. Thanks. Gracias. Okay. I have the front page bookmarked. Okay. Page 197 is the side profile. So it's, the colors are different in the picture, but it's pretty much the same picture, okay? Um, going over a few more sutures, one that's not labeled that I do want you to know, oh, it is labeled, it's just being covered by my Zoom thing here. Coronal suture right here. Oh, whoops, sorry. Coronal suture. You said that was on page 197. 197. Oh, am I looking? I'm looking in a different textbook. <laughs> uh, okay. I, the, I found the picture on 212. Okay, let me grab my other textbook. Sorry, one second. I had it bookmarked in my old textbook. Okay, so you said 212? Yes. Okay. Yes, okay, perfect. Yes, and that is the same exact picture. Okay. All right, so coronal suture between the frontal bone and parietal bone. Um, let's see, do I want you to know? Okay, those are the main sutures that I want you to know. Those are just three of them. There are more sutures, but I think that's enough. And that your book doesn't go into more detail than that. So we're not gonna go into more deep detail than that. Okay, on the frontal bone, you have this notch and you can actually feel it. It's underneath your eyebrow. If you move your finger there, you, you can kind of, if you kind of move along, you can feel a little notch in the bone. You have to move it along the ridge of the bone. That is the supraorbital foramen, and that is the place where nerves exit. Okay, and you can see it better on the next picture as well. Um, let's see. One picture, one thing that you can see really well and this picture is the, oh, it doesn't even identify it on this one. Well, I'll show you anyways. Okay, so we're looking here at the maxilla. Look down at the maxilla. You see these ridges here, kind of above the teeth? Those ridges, those are your alveolar ridges. That's something you'll need to know. On, let's see. I'm just kind of double checking things as we go on in our textbook, to make sure that we're getting everything you need to know. So looking at the mandible, there's a couple features on this area that we can look at. So here's our mandible. The mental protuberance is the pointy part of your chin. And then on either side of your chin, I don't, you may or may not be able to feel that, is a mental foramen. And the mental foramen is another place where you have vessels and nerves that are exiting. Um, in your lab, not in your lab, in your lecture manual, it does show that you have a 
quite a few structures to the mandible that you need to know. So let's see. I don't have a separate picture of the mandible set in the lecture. If you look at page 223 in your textbook, that's a great picture of the actual mandible for you to look at. So I'm going to kind of use it a little bit and try to point out some of the things on our, on our slide, but use it as a guide. Okay, so let's start right here, this rounded portion where the mandible is actually articulating with the temporal bone. That is, let's see, sometimes the names are different. Okay, that's your mandibular condyle right here. This portion where the mandible kind of looks like it's bending is the angle of the mandible. Then basically this region here, this whole kind of big portion of the mandible is the body of the mandible. And then this whole region is the ramus, or R-A-M-U-S, R-A-M-U-S of the mandible. And note that on the mandible by the teeth, you have those bumpy surfaces again, just like you had on the maxilla. Those are also alveolar ridges. Let's see. Okay, there's just a couple things. Oh, mandibular notch. Okay, I know I'm really drawing on the mandible. So this kind of region where it dips down, that's your mandibular notch. And do you need to know the coronoid process? Okay, you do need to know the coronoid process. It's kind of hard in this picture because there's a part of the mandible that kind of goes up underneath the zygomatic process. That is the coronoid process, is that pointy part that you can't see, but that is it. So honestly, I wouldn't ask you to identify that particular structure if I cannot show it in a picture, okay? But write down in your notes that page 223 is a good page for you to review when you're looking at the mandible, okay? I think we've done as much as we can on this page. So looking at a frontal view of the skull, we can really get a good picture of the facial bones, okay? And so I wanna make sure, yeah, you pretty much need to know them all. Okay. So first let's look inside the nasal cavity. So inside the nasal cavity, we have several structures um, and they're colored differently and each color represents one separate bone, okay? So all of the green, so you can see green inside the nasal cavity and you can see green inside the orbital cavity, that's all the same bone, that is the ethmoid bone. So it is inside the facial cavity, inside the nasal cavity, and it also forms part of your sinuses. So with that ethmoid bone, you have this up and down portion that is called the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone. Then you see these bumps. Those are the superior, oh, I'm sorry, I don't know, those are the middle. You can't see the superior. Those are the middle nasal concha. And below it are your inferior nasal concha. And these, both of these bumps, these, they create um, extra surface area inside your nasal cavity, 
which helps with the turbulent flow of air when you're breathing in and out, helps warm up air when it's cold because you have more surface area of skin, also helps humidify the air when you're breathing it in as well. So several important features. And just so you know, when you are getting a COVID test, that um, swab goes right there in between your middle and inferior nasal concha all the way back there. It's super fun, super pleasant. Yes, thank you, thank you. I aim to please. It wasn't, <laughs> she stood there twisting one, two, <laughs> five times. Like, oh, just take it out. Okay. Um, so then we have this little V structure down here at the base of the nasal cavity, right down here. That is the vomer. And that is a separate bone. It's not just a structure, it's a separate bone. <clears throat> okay. Let's see. So again, so our supraorbital foramen right there, kind of at the top of your, right below your eyebrow, above your eye. And then if we look inside the eye, there will be a, a closer up picture, but there are some structures that you're going to need to know. So there is a little circle here. That's your optic canal. And that is where your optic nerve travels from your eye back into your brain. Okay. Then you have this big, long, jagged hole right next to it. That's your superior orbital fissure. Okay, then down below is a smaller jagged hole. That's your inferior orbital fissure. Okay. Okay, remember how I told you the sphenoid bone is just one bone? It travels all the way through. Oh, what do we have going on here? My, oh, that's okay, Anjanette. Okay, so the sphenoid bone kind of right here, let's see. How would you describe your sphenoid bone with directional terms? How would you, um, what is your sphenoid bone to your eye? How would you describe that? Lateral. It is lateral. What else could we say? Medial to the nose. Well, our nose, is, our nose is medial, so it is lateral, so we can't, it wouldn't be medial. Superior. Um, superior is above. Deep. Deep. Deep would work, because there are many, there are many that can work for this. And then it also could be posterior, right? Mm. Yep. Yeah. 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 So there's, there's several ways that it can work. So sometimes you can have more than one right answer. Okay, so this bone, so here's our sphenoid here. Here's our sphenoid forming part of the back of the orbital cavity. Same sphenoid bone, same sphenoid bone. Travels all the way through the cranial cavity, okay? Okay, another set of foramen for you. Right here below the eye, you have them, they're about right here. Your inferior orbital foramen or infraorbital foramen. You can say inferior or infra, they mean the same thing. So you have a, sup a supraorbital foramen above and an infraorbital foramen below. So superior, inferior, or supra and infra. Same thing. Um, Let's see, what else do I need to point out here for you? I think we've talked about all these other structures. 
you can't really see the Palatine bone in this picture, so I'm not going to point it out because it's it's hiding. It's impossible. Okay, next. So this is just kind of a review of some of the major structures. Frontal bone, right here, number one. Nasal bone, you have two nasal bones. So you have a little suture right down the middle that joins those two nasal bones. Most of your nose itself, the structure is from cartilage. Your nasal bone starts way up here, okay? And then the rest of that is from cartilage. Maxilla forms the upper portion of your jaw. Uh, anterior nasal spine, that's something I didn't point out, right here, number four. So kind of between your two front teeth up to that, oh, what is that called? I can't remember the name of this part of your nose. No, the, the actual part of your nose, this part here, there's a name for it and I'm blanking on it right now. Hold on, I'll find it since we need to know. It's a weird name, like nasal columni or, oh, columni nasi, there we go. Columni nasi is this under portion of your nose right here. So if you have like a straight line from your columni nasi down to where your two front teeth basically are coming together, that would be your anterior nasal spine. Then we have our mandible or our jawbone, this whole lovely section here. And then our zygomatic bone, number six, cheekbones. Okay, and if for any reason you hear my son, you let me know and I'll tell him to quiet down. This is his only time of the day where he's allowed to play games for a little bit and he gets a little excited. So that's- Is this slide part, is this part of the um, PowerPoint? Yes. This picture? It yes. is? Yes. Okay. It should be. I'm, I'm having it. Well, I was having issues trying to find that. Were you? Well, I can double check later for you, but I'm pr pretty sure I got this one from another professor. Some of the other ones I put in myself, but this one was not done by me. Okay. It's in there. To be like page five, I believe. Okay. Slide, the it's like one. slide six. Slide okay. six. Thank okay. you. Six. Thank you. Six. Okay. Thank you very much. So just a quick review of those inner structures of the nose. So the vomer, little tiny guy right there, number one. Inferior nasal concha. Number three, middle nasal concha, number two, okay? Okay, now we're looking into the eye a little more closely. Let's see if I can give you a good page in your textbook to look at as well. Okay, this is on page 225 in your textbook. So you have a, that same exact picture you can look at and study from. <clears throat> okay, so, whoops, okay, uh-oh, I messed that there. Okay, number one, the purple bone. So this is our sphenoid bone that, ex remember, we, it extends all the way through, okay? And so the sphenoid bone forms part of the back or the posterior portion of the orbital cavity. Number three, zygomatic bone or your cheekbone also forms part of your orbital cavity, the lateral portion the side wall, the lateral wall of your orbital cavity, okay? Number five, this little red bone, the lacrimal bone. So 
So it's on the inside of your eye. And the lacrimal bone has a really neat little, it has a, what's called a lacrimal canal. There's actually a hole that travels down through the lacrimal bone and empties into your nasal cavity. And that, its job is to drain excess tears. So this is the reason why if you're crying, you have to blow your nose a lot, is because all those excess tears are running into your nasal cavity and out through your nose. Okay, number seven. Oh, goodness, this is really stretching it. <laughs> that's a little tiny part of the palatine bone. Again, that's such a tiny little sliver of the actual bone. There's better pictures of the palatine bone. I would never use this picture to identify the palatine bone. Okay, that's a promise. Number two. Frontal bone, this yellow bone here, forms part of the superior portion of the orbital cavity. And then your maxilla, the orange bone, number four, forms part of the inferior portion of the orbital cavity. Was there a question? Oh, sorry. No, you're okay, you're okay. I welcome questions. Okay, and then last one, this little green bone here, deep to your lacrimal bone, deeper into the orbital cavity is your ethmoid bone. And so if you look over here, you see one of, this is your middle nasal concha. That is also part of the ethmoid bone. So that bone extends throughout the sinuses and does form part of the orbital cavity wall. Okay, now we're looking at the skull from an inferior view. So let's, so that would be page 213 in your textbook. And I'm going to just double check on what is expected to know on this. Who what? Page what? 213. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so some foramen. Foramen, essentially, th these are holes. So I have been pointing out some of the foramen for you already. And you have several important foramen under the, at the base of the skull that you're going to need to know. Some are in your book. Oh, yeah. They're all in the book. They're in the book. I was looking at your lecture manual, trying hmm. to compare your lecture manual to the book. They're all in the book. They're, they're all, <laughs> he's like, just do them all. Okay, well then let's start, let's start right here between the two front teeth. This is the inside, the roof of your mouth that you're looking at, okay? You're looking at the underside of the skull, the inferior view. Between, right behind your two front teeth is a foramen. That is your incisive foramen. Sometimes it's called the incisive fossa. I like the word fossa because it makes me think of Mufasa. I know it's silly, but thank you, thank you. I'm here all day. Okay, so I'll write that in your incisive. Incisive foreman. Okay, you also need to know, do you need to know your palatine foreman? No but you do need to know your palatine bone. Palatine bone is this yellow bone right here. And it's, there's actually two palatine bones that are fused together right down the center. And so each side is a palatine bone. So to be really correct, if you were labeling something, you could tell me left palatine or right palatine bone based on 
whether or not there's a pair of bones. So anytime there's more than one, it's best to always be very specific in labeling. Okay, so your palatine bone forms part of your hard palate. The other part of your hard palate is formed from the maxilla, the orange portion here. Okay, let's see. I know you don't need to know all of the foramen. Let's go down here to the bottom. Foramen magnum. Magnum means large. So this is the largest foramen. What passes through the foramen magnum? Anybody know? Spinal cord. Spinal cord, that is correct. Very good. So then lateral to the foramen magnum, we have these two raised structures that are, they look white in this picture because they're in an actual human skull, they would be coated with cartilage and cartilage has a white appearance, okay? Those are the occipital condyles. This is where the base of your skull is articulating with the first cervical vertebra. And that's why you have cartilage there because that acts as a cushion between joints. Okay. I really don't think you need to know all the foramen. Ooh. Okay. I'm gonna try to stick to a plan here and not jump all over the place. So we just did our occipital condyle. The stylomastoid foramen, I'm not gonna ask you to know that. That's pretty tiny and hard to see in a picture. You might have to know that in lab. Just putting it out there. The carotid canal, I would expect you to know that. And this one is a fairly easy one to identify because it's almost circular, okay? And it's lateral to your occipital condyle and right next to the styloid mastoid process which is that spiky point right here. Okay, another foramen right next to the carotid foramen, this big one right below it, is your jugular foramen. And so passing through there is your jugular vein. And in the carotid foramen is your carotid artery. Okay, do you need to know the less serum? See, jugular carotid foramen spinosa. Okay, foreign spo foramen spinosum is not even visible on this picture. Oval, okay, foramen oval. It's oval shaped. So it's named for the shape. Foramen oval. So is there two of them for the foramen oval and the yes. regular foramen then? Yes, on either side. Very good. There's a right and a left. I'm trying to just stick to one side for now. The next foramen that I know you'll need to know, right here on the palatine bone, the larger hole that you see is your greater palatine foramen. So let's see if I can draw an arrow. Ooh. Greater Palantine. Sorry for the handwriting. Greater Palantine Foreman. Okay. Well, let's see if there's anything else. In this picture, we can identify. There's just a few that you cannot see. Oh, I missed one. Okay, foramen lacerum. And this is a big one. So when you're in lab, you look at the inferior view of the skull, this one is gonna be really obvious, okay? 
It is a long, jagged foramen um, that is anterior to the occipital condyle. That's your foramen lacerum. Okay, I think I covered most of the things here, the visible things in the picture. If it's not visible in the picture, I'm not gonna ask you to do it. That just wouldn't be fair. Okay. The clivus, so this is in your lecture manual on page 31. The clivus is this ridge right here. It's not labeled, but that is where the clivus is. Is that around the teeth there then? No, so it's, it's directly um, anterior to the foramen magnum. Okay, guys, I'm gonna. You see that? Okay. Yep. Okay. All right. I think we can move on to the next slide here. So, a simpler version of the same thing, pointing out just a few structures again. So, foramen magnum, number one, basal occipital or clivus, number two, occipital condyle. This is your palatine bone. I don't mm, I kind of disagree with this anterior and posterior palatine. But if that's the way that they want to do it, that's fine. But it's this is technically part of your maxilla. Number five is part of your maxilla. All right, well, let's just stick. Mm. Let me double check here because I've never done it that way before. It's not even that way in the book. Okay, so I will not ask you anterior, posterior palatine, okay? Number four is the palatine bone. Number five is part of the maxilla. I'm sticking to it, okay? So for our class, it's the same thing in the book. That's exactly how it's labeled. That's how I will ask you to learn it. Uh, let's see, I don't have audio, but when we take the exam and have to identify the skull, will we have to fill in the blank on the top of our head or will we have to have a word bank? We will have a word bank. Good question. Okay. Well, four and five, you said it's all maxilla together? No, five is the maxilla. Uh -huh. Four is the palatine bones. Oh, I see what you did there. Okay, that makes sense. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, no, no worries. I'm glad you asked. Okay, let's see. I can move on. All right, now we have cut the skull open and we're looking down inside. Okay, so we are taking a, <coughs> let's see, superior view. This is on page 215. You have that picture. <clears throat> and there are some more structures for you to learn. Let's see. Okay. Okay, you can see your form and magnum again. And so I'm going to focus. So I'm kind of looking at your lecture manual at the same time on number 31, kind of looking at the structures as we go, trying to identify these. There's a group of three structures that make up what's called the cella tersica. 
Does anybody know what Sela Tursika means? Turkish horse? Super close. Turkish something has to do with horse. Saddle. Turkish saddle. That's right. Sela Tursika. So the Sela Tursika is made up of three regions. And of course, it's not labeled very well here. I had a good picture. Okay. So the cella tersica is made up of the posterior edge, posterior edge, dorsum cella, hypofacial fossa is this region right here, kind of where you'd be sitting in the saddle. Where was okay. that again? This, this spot right here. Yeah, what was the name? Oh, hypo, oh, I can't say it. I'll spell it out for you. Hypo, feel, oh shoot, sorry. Sometimes when I write it, it switches to the next page. P H Y S E L Fossa. So that's kind of where you'd be sitting in the saddle. And then you have the tuberculum sale, which is the anterior portion right here. So these three terms you can find on page 31 of your workbook. Unfortunately, there isn't a picture that goes with it. You just have to kind of use the identification markers for that. Okay. Next is the petrous portion of the temporal bone. So the petrous portion of the temporal bone is this raised portion right here, right there, okay? That's the petrous portion of the temporal bone. And there are several structures associated with that, has to do with the ear. So you have the semicircular canals there, the vestibular apparatus, and both of those have to do with balance and equilibrium and the cochlea, which is your organ of hearing. Okay, can we see the optic canal? Oh, barely. Okay, you see this little hole I'm circled right there? It's also here, your internal acoustic meatus. That is the internal canal where the vestibular cochlear nerve travels through the petrous portion of the temporal bone to the brain. So carrying those signals from hearing to the brain where it's processed. Okay, cribiform plate. I like this name, just I like it. So we're looking here at this region. It's green, so it's part of the ethmoid bone. So the ethmoid bone forms part of the wall of the eye for the optic cavity, part of the nasal cavity, and then also extends up into the cranial cavity. So right down the middle of the cribiform plate is a ridge. It actually kind of looks like this. Okay, it's, it's pointy. That's the Crista galley. Crista galley. Either side of the Crista galley, you see these holes in the green. That portion where there's just a bunch of holes, little foramen, that's the cribiform plate. And this is where you have your olfactory neurons passing down from the olfactory bulbs of those olfactory nerves passing down into your nasal cavity to allow you to smell. So it's, it's pretty cool because when you look at a real skull, you'll be able to see the actual little holes that those olfactory neurons pass through. And so I shouldn't call them little holes, they're olfactory foramina. OK. 
Okay, that's your that's the correct word for that. Forum lacera, oval, rotundum. Can we see forum and rotundum in this picture? Yep. Yes, we can. Okay, so forum and rotundum, we can see it in this picture right here. There we go. And forum spinosum, we can see in this picture, it is the littlest hole right there. Forum and spinosum, forum rotundum. So there we go. We finally found a picture where we can see those. Okay. Guys, I think we got through the major stuff of the skull. Okay. Teeth. I will let you look through that part on your own. We're not gonna lecture on the teeth, but you need to know the difference between incisors, cuspids, bicuspids, and molars. And this is just the basics, okay? I'm not gonna have you identify them. Yes? Uh, can you send us like an email, since we're not gonna go through, can you just send us like a message of what we should go over by the teeth, of the teeth? That way we can like remember. I will try to remember. <laughs> if someone wants to remind me, send me a text message, that would also be super helpful because there's a lot going on. But um, I'll be super honest, the teeth are the least of my concerns. So if that helps you know how much you need to learn about the teeth, not very much. Okay. Let's see, what do we have next? All right, just a simpler picture, looking at a few structures. Form and magnum, we've done this one multiple times. The clivus, so looking at the clivus from the other side. Now we can actually see the cella tersica better. Number three, that's the dorsum cella. Number four is where you'd be sitting in the saddle, the hypotheal fossa, and the tuberculum cella, this upper portion, or where you would expect the horn of the saddle to be. But Turkish saddles don't have horns. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to get bucked around if you're riding a Turkish saddle, I don't think. Okay. Um, so you can see number six, the Christogalli is the ridge that separates your cribiform plate into right and left. I don't know what happened to the picture. Oh, there we go. Into right and left sides. Okay, Christogalli just splits it right in the middle. And number eight right here is your petrous portion of the temporal bone. Okay. A little bit more on sutures. So we're looking down the top of the skull. So a superior view of the skull. Here's our frontal bone. Here's our parietal bone. So separating the frontal bone. Is that the rear though? Would that be the occipital bone in the back there? Nope, there's our nose. Oh, okay, my bad. Sorry. That's no, all right. It's all right. <clears throat> so separating our frontal and our parietal bones is the coronal suture. So think about those planes where you can bisect the body into different regions. The coronal is kind of like wearing a crown that can go straight down through, cut your face off, if, you know, and kind of a crude way to explain it, but it could. To separate your parietal bones is your sagittal suture. And that's perfect because that is right in the mid sagittal section of your skull. So to name it the sagittal suture is perfect. And then right here in the back, you can see just a small portion of your occipital bone. 
there we go, occipital. And so the suture there that separates the occipital from the parietal is your lambdoidal suture. What happened to my pictures? Okay. Then a couple, no, not sure. Oh, there is another suture. We talked about the squamosal suture. Temporal suture. Parietal. So the squamosal suture is right here between your parietal and your temporal bone. So squamosal suture. Okay. And then the last suture is a sphenosquamosal suture, which is between the sphenoid bone and the temporal bone. So you have a total of five sutures that you need to know, and they're listed on page 32 of your le lecture workbook. I'm trying to figure out what did I do with my... There we go. What page is the PowerPoint set on? This is the last page of the PowerPoint. Okay, gotcha. Yes. Okay, I want us to get into the eyes and ear as much as we can. Okay. <clears throat> okay, the eye. Major function of the eye is vision. There are six muscles associated with the eye and then one tendon. So there are all, they're all listed here. I'll show you, sorry. Excuse me. Show you on the next slide. Um, so let me actually get to the right place in our workbook, I'm trying to stay up with what we're doing. Anybody know what page the I is on in the workbook? Ah. Uh, Yeah, uh, that's okay. I will stop looking at the workbook for now. Can you see the, the textbook? Yes, we can look at the textbook. No, but like, you know how you've been saying on page 30 something on your workbook, like, is that the same thing as our textbook? Or no, no. Is, no. is that the top hat? Or? That's the top hat. So I have the physical copy. You have the digital copy, but it should be the same page numbers. How do you look up? The, well, after class, can you show me how to look up the page numbers? Because I've been struggling the whole time trying to find it. I can certainly try. Yeah. Yeah, I've had a hard time with that, too. Okay, we'll look at Top Hat together. Okay. Um, let's take a quick break and do attendance, see who's here. And then we'll get into eyes. So let's do that really quick. So if you're here, just unmute yourself. So I can hear you and then mute yourself again unless you want to say something else, okay? Is Amy Barcel here? She's here, I think. Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to get the computer. Good. There Is we go. Dan Danielle? Here. Thank you. Eric Bennett? Here. Okay. Kirsten Brutus? Here. Kira Castle. Okay. Miranda Collins. Here. Okay. Ashley Conley. Grayson Esnick. Esink, sorry. Here. Okay. Crystal Fortune. Here. Chelsea. Here. Jason Hansen. Here. Madeline Johnson. 
She said she's here. She typed it. She typed it. Okay. I missed the type. Thank you. Ryan Kronberg. Go twins. They're twins? Go twins. Oh, oh go twins. Okay. Go A's. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. Thank you. Lindsay, Lindsay. I'm not going to try to say your last name. Lindsay K. Okay. Macy. Here. Okay. Corinne. Here. Jessica Lucero. Here. Elizabeth Morales. Here. Anna Moran. Here. Anne Jeanette. She's here. She's here. here. Okay, thank you. Morgan. Here. Did I hear a baby? I'm babysitting my nieces. Oh, that is very nice of you. Olivia. Okay. Maisie. What, Maisie? I see your name. I see you're here. Okay. Rona. It's me. And I might have said I was here for Maisie. Oh. She said that it cracked on her a little bit ago. Okay. She was in here. She was in here, so you both were here. Yeah, she uh, Zoom crashed on her, and she couldn't get back in. Okay, okay, she was here. I'll give her credit. Yeah. Okay, thank you. No All problem. right. Was there a question? Okay, so let's get into the eye muscles. There are six eye muscles or extrinsic eye muscles. So here we go. There are, so they're named for their location and their direction. So let's start at the top, superior oblique. Is this, oh, my red, my red blends in with the muscle. Is this muscle kind of back in the back? Okay, I'm trying to color it in. That's your superior oblique. And you can kind of see the top portion of it up here. Okay. Superior rectus. Rectus means straight. So this is a superior, it's above and it's straight. So it's named for its location and its shape. Okay, so your superior rectus. Your lateral rectus is right along the side. So it's lateral to the eye and it is straight. And then you also have an inferior rectus, which is down below, attaches to the inferior portion of your eye and is also straight and runs back to the back of the eye socket. Then you have the inferior oblique muscle here. And oblique means at an angle. So you have, it's inferior, so it's below and at an angle. And then your, let's see. Yeah, the superior oblique, we already pointed that out. And then the other in, neat little structure is called the trochlea. And it's just this like connective tissue loop that holds the superior oblique muscle so when that muscle contracts, it actually contracts and gives it a twisting motion. So that allows you to roll your eyes, for example. All the teenagers across the universe are thankful <laughs> for that trochlea because it allows them to give them that eye roll or the 12 year old in the next room. Okay, looking again at just the other side of the eye, the medial view of the eye, you have the medial rectus. So right in the medial side of the eyeball is the medial muscle, which is long and straight. Okay. And we talked about all of the other ones already. There are only six of these. Okay. Looking at some of the structures of the eye, Hmm, 
let's look at the bottom picture first. So just some major regions or structures. Oh, I'm sorry. That lacrimal canal or nasal lacrimal duct, same thing. I know I called it lacrimal canal before. So I'll put that down there. Nasal lacrimal duct is very descriptive. It tells you exactly where it is. This is where it drains those excess tears into your nasal cavity. This region right in the corner of your eye is your medial canthus. That little bump right there is the lacrimal caruncle. And then on the other side, the other edge of your eye is your lateral canthus. Then above your eye, kind of right here, is the lacrimal gland, which produces tears. And so it would explain why if you had a good cry, ladies or gentlemen, I suppose, your eyes get puffy. It's because you have really worked that lacrimal gland and it is swollen and inflamed. And it takes a while for the eyes to like stop being so puffy. Okay, looking at the top picture, we'll look more at the detail of the eye in the next picture, but the sclera is the white of the eye, okay? Okay, so looking at the pathway of light as it enters your eye, light is essential for you to be able to see. And after this slide, I will show you a picture where we can kind of look at those structures and follow the pathway. It travels from the cornea to the anterior chamber through the, pu the pupil, which is the small black hole, which can dilate or constrict, which lets in more light or less light, depending on light conditions. Then your posterior chamber, then to the lens. And this is, the lens is a harder, harder material, but it's still flexible, has the ability to contract and stretch out. And that helps um, focus the light to the back of the eye. And as we age, I'm learning this now, I'm getting to that age right now where the lens starts to harden and it's less flexible and you start needing to wear glasses more often. Yeah, it happens. It happened to my mom at this age and I remember making fun of her and now it's happening to me. <laughs> Karma. Okay, then we have the posterior cavity. Then the retina, this is where your photoreceptors are, where, oh my goodness, I am so sorry. Whew. I guess I needed more coffee today. The retina is where your photoreceptors are, your rods and your cones, where the light is actually hitting the back of your eye. Your retina coats the back of the eyeball and that trans that light signal into electrical impulses into nervous signals which then travel to the optic nerve and then into the brain okay so here is a good picture I like this nice picture this is a great side profile of the eye a great one for identification purposes hint hint I do like this one it's not overly detailed, but it does have all of those structures. I am so sorry. How are we doing on time? Okay, we got about five more minutes. I'll stop. I'm sorry, I'll try not to yawn anymore. Okay. I'm gonna get you some coffee. <laughs> three blocks from Telegraph Mill, so. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like I've had a lot of coffee today too, so I think it's just been a long day. Okay. So light coming in hits the cornea, which is the transparent portion of the eye. Okay. And in 
right inside the cornea is what we call our anterior chamber. That is filled with a, a liquid called aqueous humor. And it's a thin fluid and it help, it circulates through kind of this, the anterior portion of the eye and helps keep it healthy. Then the light passes through the pupil, through the lens. Here's our lens right here. Then it enters the posterior chamber. And the posterior chamber is filled with, or sorry, posterior cavity, posterior cavity. The posterior cavity is filled with vitreous humor, which is very viscous. It's kind of like jello jiggler consistency, um, really thick. And that helps keep the light focused. It travels all the way to the back of the eye, ideally to this little spot called the fovea centralis. And the fovea centralis has a highly concentrated area of rods and cones, specifically cones. And it helps you to have very um, sharp visual acuity. So the yellow that you see here, this yellow layer represents the retina. It is neuronal layer of rods and cones. These are receptors. <clears throat> they receive the light signals, they undergo a chemical change, which triggers an electrical signal, travels up the optic nerve into the brain, and then is perceived as sight. Okay. So we're just looking at the flow right now of, of the light. Okay. So the retina is part of the eye that's involved in vision. So a really important little thing to remember, made of two primary cell types, the rods. And the rods are the photoreceptor that does well in low light conditions. And if it's dark enough, take, take some time to notice, go outside tonight or turn the lights off or when you go to bed, can you see in color when it's dark? I know what Ryan's answer is. If you don't know, I want you to experiment tonight. After you turn the lights out, look around your room or go outside, look around. Can you see in color? Yes or no? That will tell you which receptor is working in low light conditions. So I kind of gave my answer away, but rods are not able to detect color. Cones, on the other hand, operate in bright conditions, give you very strong visual acuity, and they are the color receptors. Okay, so once a rod or a cone is activated, they send impulses up through the optic nerve to the brain. So I'm gonna go back to this picture really quick. So here's our optic nerve. There's a region called the optic disc. This is where all the nerves come together to form the optic nerve. At that spot in the back of the eye, there are no photoreceptors. So you actually have a blind spot in your eye. So you may do a little lab experiment to find your blind spot, which is really kind of fun to do. Um, or you can even do it online. There's simple little tests you can do. It's kind of neat to do. Okay. Same picture. All right, so looking just at a side profile, is there anything new we wanna look at or identify? Um, We're in the sclera. Yes, that's exactly what I was thinking. So just so you know, the sclera, this is the outermost layer. It's made up of connective tissue. It is white. So it's the white of your eye. Then the sclera and the cornea are all one tissue, but in the corneal region, it's clear. 
okay? And you can do corneal transplants now. Do you guys know that? So you can get corneal transplants. Uh, the choroid is the middle layer of the eye. So you have three layers. The outer layer is the sclera. The choroid layer or the pigmented layer is the second layer. And then the innermost layer is the retina where you have your photoreceptors. So you should know those three basic layers. The choroid layer is your pigmented layer that helps absorb extra light and prevents it from scattering in your eye so you have better visual acuity. And the sclera is very tough and very strong. Okay, let's see. <clears throat> Okay, we've already talked about the retina, talked about the cornea and the sclera. Okay, the iris is the color, the colored portion of your eye and or the, the pigmented portion of the eye that varies in you know, blue, brown, green, gray, black. People have different eye colors. Um, the iris itself has the ability to contract to make the pupil smaller or it dilates to make the pupil larger. That lets in more or less light. So in low light conditions, your pupils will dilate to let in more light so you can see better. And in high light conditions, they are gonna constrict to let in less light. The ciliary body. This is a set of muscles. It's actually a ring of muscle, okay? And so this is gonna be a really terrible picture. I apologize ahead of time. So this colored in portion, we're gonna say is the ciliary body. It is a smooth muscle. And in the center is your lens. Then you have these fibers attached to the lens. That ciliary body can contract or relax, and that changes the shape of the lens, which helps focus the light to the back of the eye so that it hits that fovea centralis just right. So that's a terrible picture, sorry. Um, what happened? Okay. So looking a little closer at the retina and the optic disc, so you can see here with the retina, the yellow layer, we have our photoreceptors. There's actually a layer of three neurons all lined up that form the retina. And then they send their signals and join together to form that optic nerve. At the optic disc, this is where the optic nerve exits the eye and you also have blood vessels traveling through there. So there are no photoreceptors at your optic disc. So that it would be your blind spot. And you can see this dark layer right here. That's your pigmented portion. Right here is your choroid layer, and then your sclera. Okay, so looking closer, and I think we'll, oh, we're, we're past our time, so we'll end with this slide today. This is a good slide. So we're looking at the eye closer to the ciliary body. You can see those fibers that attach to the lens. There is fluid, so remember in the anterior chamber, what kind of fluid do we find there? Anybody remember? It's our aqueous. Vitreous aqueous. Aqueous humor. Oh, that's right. In the back. In the back is your vitreous humor. That's where you just got those 
a little bit switch. So what's really important is in the anterior chamber, and then this, this portion here is our posterior chamber, not our posterior cavity, they're different. Our posterior chamber, you have this aqueous humor that is circulating and it's actually produced by the ciliary body, okay? So it actually has a couple functions and it circulates from the posterior chamber up and through to the anterior chamber and then it exits through this little hole here. It's a drainage, little drainage canal. So when I tell you the name of this, this is the canal of Schlem. No joke, that's what it's called. And this has real life consequences for somebody who, if this canal of Schlem is narrow or becomes blocked can cause a very serious condition that can cause blindness. Does anybody want to guess what that condition might be? Glaucoma. Glaucoma, that's right. So someone who has narrow angles, for example, narrow angles would be this angle here. If that angle is more narrow, it's harder for the fluid to actually leave that canal of Schlem and can easily build up and cause pressure in the eye, which can lead to damage and blindness. So that is, that is a real concern for some people. I will tell you, my grandmother had glaucoma. My mother and my aunt both had narrow angles, so they had to go in and do a procedure called a laser irritotomy where they actually go in and poke a little hole with a laser in the eye so that it can drain, so they don't have the buildup of fluid. I've been tested and I don't have narrow angles, at least not enough to get that procedure, thankfully, because I don't want somebody with a laser in my eye. Not to, you know, not to say that it's not useful, but for me, I'm a little scared of that. Okay. Is, so, is that, an issue with normal pressure glaucoma or just regular glaucoma or both? So with normal um, pressure, you have normal to low pressures already. You don't have the high pressure in the eye like normal glaucoma. This would just be, this is just with people who have narrow angles. So narrow angle glaucoma. If, and if that makes any sense. I don't know a ton about glaucoma other than the part about the narrow angles and how that can lead to glaucoma. But um, if that answers your question at all, there are different types, you are right. So, okay, so we made it through the eye. So looking at our schedule, our exam is by Midnight, September 9. Now, we can actually get the ear done that day in lecture. Or we can just finish the ear the next class period. How are you guys feeling? You feeling ambitious? Or do you want to end it with this? I'm game for whatever, what anybody else wants to do. Okay, I know what Ryan wants. <laughs> We haven't even gone over the year in, in lab yet either, so. You haven't? Not, not with a model. We've got homework to do on it, but. Okay. All right, you know what? We've done a lot. I think that's enough for our first exam. We will still cover the year on Wednesday, but it will not be on your first exam, okay? But it will be on your next quiz and your next exam after that. So I'm writing myself a note really quick. So the exam will be everything up until the I. Yes. Okay. So exam one, everything but here. And the uh, exam would be taken on Canvas, not yes. in the classroom? Okay. Yes, on Canvas. So all exams and quizzes are on Canvas. And 
just the lecture um, workbook is on top hat. Okay. So your homework is on top hat. So let's take a quick moment and switch gears and check out top hat. Because I know some people wanted to look at that really quick. So wait, let me find. Are the quizzes going to be on Respondus then, or we can just take them however? Until I get Respondus working, they're going to just be on Canvas. All right, thank you. Yes. So let me find. Okay. My son likes that I'm teaching right now because he gets to play games. He's super excited about that. He's a great trade-off, he thinks. Okay, so this is what you should see when you get to Top Hat. Um, so if you, let's just say you click on chapter one, you should have two options. One would be the chapter and one would be your worksheet. So if you clicked on the chapter, it takes a moment, it has all of the class material. Oh, it doesn't show you the page numbers. That I was, I didn't know that. Okay, so it doesn't give you the page numbers. I apologize. I was hoping that it did. But it does give you all of the information that we've been talking about. Does that help? Were there other questions about Top Hat? No, that's exactly what I was looking at. I just, you know, wasn't following when you said the page numbers. So that makes sense now. That's because I was looking at a hard copy. That was that was my misunderstanding. Yeah. I apologize. No, that makes sense now though. Thank you. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Any other things I can look through with Top Hat with you guys? Um, I just had a quick question. Do we have homework tonight in Top Hat then? Let's check our schedule. So today is the second. Nothing should be due. It looks like the next time something yeah. is due in Top Hat is September 9. You did have something that said December 2nd that it was due. And <laughs> I did it because I was assuming that it was for September 2nd and maybe it was just like a typo. Do you remember what the topic was? I think it was for... Um, the integumentary system, I want to say, or the cells and tissues. It was one of those, but I did complete it. Okay, okay. <clears throat> cells and tissues. Okay, what well, that worksheet was due on Monday. Integumentary, so integumentary. integumentary is later. Yeah. Yeah, see, December 2nd. That oh, is correct. Is that correct? Oh, that's yeah. weird the way it was listed then. It, it is really weird. It, um, it's one of the last things we cover in class. Oh, okay. Well, I already did the homework, so. <laughs> well, there you go. Now you're ahead of it. Good. Anything else? Did I miss any chat questions? Um, so the exam is going to be over chapters. Uh, can you just name the, say, say the chapters? That way I can just make sure I got it correct. Oh, boy. I don't have the chapters written down. I have it by topic. It looked like on Canvas you had something um, under, maybe it was the modules that said exam, and then if you clicked on it, it listed some of the things that were on the exam. Okay, let's go over there. So for exam one, it has all of the topics and all of the lectures. Yeah, and I think if you click on exam one, it actually like breaks down. Does it? I want to say that's how I got there. Oh, yeah. see, yep. somebody else helped share some of their stuff with me, so I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh -huh. That's great. So it does give you 
a great breakdown of exactly what you need to know. So, so the integumentary system will be on this exam one then? No, no. Okay. okay. I need to, I'll have to go through and fix this. It is okay. it's on your schedule. So the lecture schedule that has been put on, um, let me show you. So go back to modules. I just put up a separate lecture schedule all by itself, anatomy schedule. Oh, okay. And that will tell you exactly what we're gonna have right there. Oh, okay, great. Okay. And that tells you your workbook chapters and your workbook chapters are the day that it's due is usually the day you have a quiz or an exam. So everything that says on the exam, like brain, the nerve, the brain, nerve, like that's oh, what's No, okay, so that day we're going to lecture about the brain and cranial nerves, but we're, that is not on your first exam. So what is on your first exam? I wonder if I can draw in here. No, I can't. What's on your first exam is everything before that. So the anatomical terminology, cells and tissues, skulls, and eyes. No ears, because we'll do ear after our first exam. So on September 9, we will start talking about the ear. Then we'll go into the brain. Does that help? Perfect. Yeah, thank you yes. so thank much. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. okay. And at any time you need clarification, just text me or send me an email and I will try to respond to you as quickly as I can. Okay. Okay. Anything else before we end for the day? I know we went over a lot. Sorry about that. All good. Thanks. Yep, that should be it. That'd be good. <laughs> okay, let's see here. Screen sharing. All right, guys, if that is it, then I'm going to let you go for tonight. Thank you so much for participating and showing up and being here. I really appreciate it and have a fantastic Labor Day. Oh, you as well and feel better. You will, yeah. Thank you. I am feeling a lot better. So okay. I think my test is negative. I just don't have the results yet. Sure. <laughs> feeling a lot better. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. All right. Well, I will see you guys after our little vacation. Sounds good. All right. Night. Night. Night.